Hello. Today I'm here to give my retrospective on the first of the original Star Wars trilogy, uh, which obviously is Episode 4, A New Hope. Um, here's my other uh, little DVD trilogy box set. Uh, I think I discussed earlier that I had the all of them individually and all that, and then I obtained these, or I bought those, because, well, they take up less space, and uh, I have a bunch of movies on another shelf over there, and they get quite full, so... All of that uh, aside, um... With this particular installment in the franchise, I, um... I have talked about it quite a bit over the... Uh, many episodes of this series. Um, I've expressed how it's, the, in my opinion, it's my favorite of the entire franchise. It is what I would call the best movie ever made. And I don't know, I just don't know what all I can really say. Uh, so this will probably be the shortest of all of them, of the retrospectives I've given. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what all I can really say that anybody hasn't said. Um, I made a video before this one, but it went on too long, and it was just essentially... And the reason it did was because I was just given the entire plot, and nobody needs that. Uh, people have most likely seen this movie. It's one of the most um, well-known movies ever made. I'm sure people have seen this at least once in their life. Um, so there's no point in that. I just love it for so many reasons. One is just how George Lucas uh, put together a lot of things from mythology and uh, history, like uh, the elements of like in terms of the war, like American Revolution, as well as um, um, World War Two elements are in this film. Anything throughout the whole trilogy, honestly. Um, uh, they're, they're the characters, you know, they're just sort of your classic fairy tale uh, characters in a science fiction setting. It's a space opera, you know. Luke is that uh, the hero who sort of comes from nothing and then becomes, at the end of the journey, uh, the hero of the story he is the hero of the original trilogy. Um, obviously, with the prequels, you know, Anakin is the hero because get to that with Turn of the Jedi. But at the core of it, Luke Skywalker is the hero. He is the hero that you follow throughout the entirety of the film. And who you root for. Um, and along the way, we meet, you know, C-3PO and R2-D2 are we see at the beginning of the film, as well as Princess Leia. Uh, but Luke is the true lead of the film. Uh, I guess Princess Leia would be the lead female character, and uh, Luke is the lead male. Obi-Wan Kenobi is the classic wizard. You know, Leia, classic princess who's kidnapped. Uh, by the villain of the film, Darth Vader. Though, you know, uh, Tarkin, Grand Moff Tarkin, and in many ways is, uh, though then again, just because of his, uh, of him essentially being in charge of the Death Star, like running it for the Emperor, in, in a way. Um, you know, he's, he's so high up in the Empire, that, you know, Vader and him have a mutual respect for each other. In a way, the, uh, uh, the Death Star, in many regards, is the domain of Tarkin's, essentially. Uh, though, of course, the Emperor is the overall head of all of it. You know, but, you know, when the Emperor isn't there, I mean, he has to take orders from the Emperor, but otherwise it's like, you know, Listen to Tarkin. 
Darth Vader does that. And, um, but yeah, and, um, Han is the typical, he's the guy who doesn't really want to do anything, like get involved in whatever the conflict is. Yet in the end, he, uh, he does, he gets involved, and then he helps out in the end, which uh, culminates in helping save the day. Uh, Chewbacca is his, you know, he's his friend, his right-hand man, um, sidekick. I don't know if I would consider Chewbacca a sidekick, but, you know, one might consider that, or say that about Chewbacca. R2 and 3PO are the comedic relief in this trilogy, essentially. The way they banter back and forth, it's quite humorous. Um, it's funny as uh, R2-D2 uh, was really supposed to be quite foul-mouthed. It's supposed to be swearing quite a bit. But George Lucas decided just to rewrite it and have him just beep and boop. But some of the reactions that 3PO had uh, when R2 was swearing ends up in the script and in the final film, such as you watch your language and and other reactions of that. That's just when I've heard that I'm like, that actually does make quite a bit of sense. Um and that just sort of makes the dynamic between those two and R2 just funnier. Um But yeah these these are classic characters from stories People sort of grew up listening to from their parents or just classic stories told to them and other perhaps movies before it. Um, Hidden Fortress, uh, the Kira Kurosawa film, was a big influence on this film, with the plot. Um, and other, you know, Kurosawa films in general, as well as The Searchers, particularly with the homestead burning scene for with Luke. There are so many things that inspired Lucas making Star Wars, you know, Joseph Campbell's The Hero of Thousand Faces, um, The Hero's Journey, and everything. It's, it's, there is so much into this movie, and I just love it. I love learning about the movie. I love watching all the documentaries pertaining to not just this film, but the original trilogy as a whole, like The Empire of Dreams. I just love this so much. It's just such an incredible film, an incredible story with great characters, classic characters, but in a setting that at that time wasn't exactly, you know, you didn't really see those sort of characters in that kind of setting. Um, not seeing that never happened before, but, you know, it's not really all that well known or didn't get much notoriety at the time. Um, George Lucas, um, with his writing, I think, you know, with Star Wars, the franchise of Star Wars, the films he wrote, uh, he, he, his writing really does fit with Star Wars. It's space opera, there's melodramatic moments with the acting and all that. I've talked about that before with the prequels, um, but in case you didn't see those videos, I will do the best to link them above, um, I will try to, sometimes I say that, but then I just forget, because, you know, that's me, uh, I tend to do one thing, and then I just, uh, slips my mind, unfortunately, um, but I will do my best, uh, and there is a playlist of my channel, so you can find, you know, film talk and all that, and then you can find those videos with retrospectives. But anyway, there's there's just so much of this film that people have said that's like at this point, what what could one say about this particular film? Not just the franchise or this trilogy, but this film. So much has been said. I can just just give it as much praise as I could, uh, day and night. But again, I don't want to be here all day and possibly bore you because while you might share my enthusiasm for this particular film uh, and enjoy it it's like you know sometimes what can you say 
it might be best to just watch it. Um, um, some people have co uh, complained about Luke, uh, like how he acts, but I'm like, you know, he's a teenager. He's 19 years old. Not every 19 year old is completely immature. I think the character is quite mature for what's going on in it. Also, he's fascinated of going on a journey and an adventure, and yet is also unprepared for a lot of this. He learns about the Force a bit from Obi-Wan when he's at where Obi-Wan lives at, and he's given the lightsaber. And as he's turning it on and moving it, and Obi-Wan tells him about uh, the lightsaber and earlier the Force and just all of that. For me, that's the best scene of the entire film. I just love how we learn uh, so much about just enough of the Force and a lightsaber and how it's the weapon of the Jedi and all of this and just... Well, in the prequels, we do learn a bit more about that that sort of thing, which I, I have no problem with. I, you know, I enjoy the prequel, so that was sort of a bonus to hear some more explanation on those, just how important the Force is and how, and as well as the, the importance of the lightsaber and how it's like sort of like the, this weapon is your life, is what we want told Anakin. Um, here it's quite condensed, just a bit, just enough, so you get just the general idea of how important the lightsaber is and the force is. And then Darth Vader even says how the the the, the technology in the battle station of the Death Star is insignificant to the power of the force. Um, And again, back to Luke, uh, being a bit more immature. Uh, really, the, for people complaining about the performance by Mark Hamill, really stems from him saying the lines, but I want to go to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters, some of that line, and just how whiny he, he comes off. Um, watching this movie over and over, as much as I have, I sort of get the idea, there's like Luke and no one sort of have butted heads over the years. And while Luke loves his uncle and his uncle loves him, you know, we get more dialogue from Owen and Baru later, how he wants, he doesn't, he's afraid of Luke being like his father. Um, because at the, we, they don't really know who... It doesn't appear that they know who, that, what happened to Anakin. Like he became Darth Vader. Uh, it seems they just know he's dead. Uh, Luke's mother is dead, and um, they're gonna take care of Luke. And he doesn't want what happened to Anakin to happen to Luke. He cares about Luke. He loves Luke. He just, uh, he seems like he doesn't want, you know, anything bad to happen to him, but he's not trying to, he doesn't seem to explain why. And as a result, Luke wants to leave, he wants to have adventures and just do things. Like, his friends are all almost pretty much gone. And, and the deleted scenes of this film, on the Blu-ray, we see a conversation with Biggs, who, in the original cut... It's only at the very end of the de in the X Wing. Uh, but the special edition sort of gives another scene before they all take off to fight at the Death Star and you get the you get to know a bit more about Biggs and Luke's friendship. Just a little bit. Um so they're all most of his friends are gone. Luke wants to leave too, but he just sort of seems like he guilt trips Luke into staying on the farm or just staying on Tatooine instead of going off and in potential danger. Um, you know, it's. 
I can understand why Owen would do that. And yet, you can also see the frustration with Luke. He wants to go off and have fun and do th th things that are like, you know, like, you know, that's great. Or at least fun. But Owen sort of... Uh, does what he can to pull him back home, pull him back to where he lives. And um, you see the frustration. And, um, I can understand that. And I, could, I get why he's like, oh, he's just whiny and this and that. Like, well, you know, sort of like father like son, but I don't think Luke was that whiny and compared to Anakin. Um, but then again, with Anakin, a lot of that comes from repressing his feelings and not being able to sort of act like a normal person because you know how the Jedi were back then which was sort of like their downfall uh, with Luke he wants to go off and do something be it something great and important or just go off and see the galaxy I don't know, I, I think people can identify with that at some point. Like, everybody wants to go off and do something, but you just... But at the end of it, it just doesn't happen. Unfortunate, yeah, but... You know... It is what it is, it seems. Like, um... Uh, Alec Guinness is fantastic in this, also. I know many know that you know, he didn't seem to be fond of the franchise or anything later on. But what it seems like, it's uh, after the trilogy ended and uh, he did other work, people just seem to want to just talk to Alec Guinness about Star Wars only or sneak Star Wars in in any conversation or interview or whatever it is. And this is a man who is like in fantastic films like Lawrence of Arabia and uh, Dr. Zhivago and Bridge on the River Kwai, which won him an Academy Award. So many other great films. Star Wars is a great film also. The entire trilogy is great, but, you know, here he is, often getting Star Wars brought up in some way. And I can completely understand an actor of his caliber with the amount of work he had done with working with all of the f uh, filmmakers and all the people. Like, well, I'm sure, you know, on one hand, he's proud of Star Wars. You know, while he wasn't the biggest fan of the dialogue, which many have attested to. Uh, but as I've repeated quite a bit with the space opera thing, you know, it's kind of some slack there, but... Uh, it, he, d he went all out. He didn't just getting paid quite a bit of money and he didn't sort of hardly try he did his best as he always did and he shines just as much as Mark Hamill shines or Carrie Fisher or Harrison Ford or any of the other actors in this film they're all incredible and George Lucas did a fantastic job of getting everybody together and getting the best out of everybody uh, on the, not just the cast, but the crew also, everyone involved. Um, of course, there's John Williams. John Williams really shines with the music. The score rightfully deserves the American Film Institute's greatest film score of all time. It's said to be the most recognizable score ever in film history, at least within the first, like, the hundred years that they were going by. And I would just argue, just in general, people know Star Wars. People know the theme, at the very least. Similar to Jaws. Um, such a classic theme, you just know what it is. Same with Star Wars. And he deserved all the accolades he received for this movie. You know, the Academy Award, the Golden Globe, the BAFTA, the Grammy, all of for at the time, I believe he won every single award he ever got, or was nominated for. Then later, there's like some collaborated or 
culmination of the soundtracks, of the scores of the original trilogy, nominated for some other awards. He didn't necessarily lose, or even win those, but um, that just goes to show just how incredible his scores for these films are. And this one, I think, it really shines. Uh, I mean, the cantina scene, the, op the first song, it's just... Once you hear it, you can't forget it. And they have a second song that's played. And yeah, it's just fantastic. Um, and of course, there's the special edition. Uh, many aren't fond of uh, those, but uh, this version has both the uh, special edition and on the second desk there is the original theatrical release of Star Wars. Before it was called A New Hope. Um, and with Empire Strikes Back, they began numbering them. Empire in theaters was released as Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back. Return of the Jedi was Episode 6, The Return of the Jedi. 1981, this got called Star Wars Episode 4. Now there's been various things like, oh, it was never supposed to be 4 or whatever. But then there's like, claims that it was, and that Alan Ladd Jr. told George Lucas, you can't call it episode four. This is, there has not been a Star Wars film ever before this. It is the first one. And well, if to you, it might be the fourth movie, and you might make the first three later on sometime, uh, but you just can't call it Star Wars. So, while there is some debate over that, whatever you think, I don't know, there's Quite enough evidence, I would say, I would find to sort of support both arguments. Uh, it does seem likely, from what I've seen, he George Lucas said he always wanted to start this in the very middle of the story. Um, like, in episode four would be now like three and four. Back when there was just six movies, that was the middle, and this is the end of the middle. And then. The next two are the end. Of course, now there's more Star Wars films, so... Now this, I guess, would be the very beginning of the middle. Uh, and... It, it's... It's really uh, interesting. Um, you know, this came from a, originally of a 250 to 300 page script. George Lucas has talked a bit about here and there. And now he took just a section of that script... And he originally had like a little, a couple pages, uh, uh, which would essentially give some background, I guess, little seeds of what the prequels would eventually become, just to give some backstory to help explain all that has happened with this, led up to this film, uh, and we get that crawl also to help explain it, and which Brian De Palma helped George Lucas create, um. It's really fantastic just to learn about this film and the trilogy, and I just, I always love it. I always re love rewatching it, and I don't hate the special editions. I understand some have problems with it, and I do agree that while, you know, there is this DVD of um, that has both, and while people do complain about the original cut of this film on here, from, coming from a laser disc. Uh, transfer that you know doesn't has the aspect ratio like bars on the sides and on the top and you have to do stuff with your TV or your DVD your blu-ray player or whatever you've got and do some settings so it fills up the entire screen so those bars on the sides don't appear well that is annoying at the same time I'm like, you essentially have the original cut on DVD. Um, you know, uh, there it is. And, well, George Lucas didn't uh, has often said, you know, even in 1977, he was disappointed with how uh, Star Wars came out. You know, A New Hope. Because it was unfinished. Even back then, he said it's unfinished. And hopefully when technology... Uh, gets better. We can reinsert certain scenes uh, and make them better. Make them look 
better than the ever, like the effects and all that, but due to the technology limitations, and they were pushing the limit what you could do with special effects, so there is a great achievement in that. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just an incredible film. And again, you know, I've, I've talked about the Academy Awards and how I believe it should have won, have won Best Picture, Director, Screenplay, and Supporting Actor. Talked about that enough. I'm not going to talk about that again. So just, I'm sure if you follow me, I'm sure you're thankful for that. I mean, honestly, at this point, I've made my point, I think, quite clear. I'm not fond of the the winner is of picture, director, and screenplay. No, no point in continuing on with that. But, you know, it's, it is incredible. It's an incredible film. All the accolades it received, it deserved, in my opinion. And, yeah, that's... I don't know. This is all I really have to say. I I don't have much more to add. Um, oh, sorry. So, yeah, I... Next week, I will do five and six. There you go. Uh, you'll get two for one in a day. Um, yeah, I... I I kind of enjoy doing that, you know, scheduling them to be released at certain times. Um, but yeah, um, that's really all I gotta say. So, um, have a great day, have a great weekend, have a great week, and until next time, I'll see you all later. Uh, and also, what do you think of this film? Also, um, you like it? Not like it? Uh, hate the special edition? Or you like me, you don't mind them. But you wish the Blu-ray had the... Uh, that's another thing. I wish the Blu-ray did have the option to letting us see the special edi uh, original cut. Aside from just the special editions. Um, I don't know. George Lucas just prefers the versions of the special edition. Because it's, I guess, closer to what he wanted. He wanted that scene with Jabba the Hutt. Even though people are like, it's just redundant with the Greedo scene. Um... Which is true, but, you know, hey, wanted to show uh, this guy Jabba early on. And some think it's completely just ruins the mystique of episode six when we first see him. But then again, um, it seems there was never supposed to be a sort of mystery or mystique or whatever with Jabba. You were always supposed to see him. But because of technical limitations... Didn't get to in 1977, but 97 onward, we got to see Jabba in this film. Um, so with all that, you know, again, hope you all do uh, have a great time, and yeah, see you all ne next time. Bye.